Till this time, we have talked about determining the present value or future value of lump sum cash flows, single sum of it. At the same time, we have done some questions on the NUT part also, where is a series of cash flow you could get over a period of time or you would be investing over a period of time. So determining the present value and future values on a series of cash flow. We've done a question on the PMT determination of EMI or from a loan also. Uh, let's take another example here with regard to working with uh, distinct cash flows when the cash flows are not same and they change over a period of time and uh, let's talk about somebody investing into a project uh, and the initial outlay into the project is somewhere around $50,000 and this project is expected to generate cash flows for coming four years but the cash flows are not same they are different. So let's look up onto the cash flows as you could see it is around 50,000 outflow today in the next year you get around 15,000 in terms of cash and then to uh, 20, 20 and 15. Now to, to determine whether the project is viable or not, let's assume another thing that the required return for the investor is around 10%. So discounting this cash flows, the future expectation to present value terms will let us compare the 50s outflow today with inflows in future. So what we think about is let's bring this 15 to the base here 0, 20 again, 20 again and 15 again and all these present values could be added to determine the net PV cash inflow from the project. So present value of cash inflow and then you subtract the PV cash outflow which is 50,000 to see whether the project is viable to you today or not. And what do we come to know about is that the NPV is positive 5436.76. Now there are two ways to do this thing. Determine the present value of each of the cash flow one by one using the TVM functions or the BA2 plus professional provides you with uh, the cash flow function. And how does it work? We have given the instructions in the slide itself that you could see just put your 50,000 outflow as C0 then uh, in C01 you put 15,000 as inflow and then as you press the down arrow key you get F01 which is basically the frequency so you're getting 15,000 for one year only so we kept the frequency as 1 C02 as 20,000 which is coming for two consecutive years that's why we've kept the frequency for two and C03 which is eventually the fourth year cash flow is 15,000. Now <clears throat> near to the cash flow key you have this NPV key. Click on the NPV key. You will find uh, I put I equals to 10%. Use the down arrow key to calculate the things like NPV, NFV, payback period, discounted payback period. So majority of different distinct cash flow functions can be done and calculations can be done via that CF function of the Kelsey itself. Now the more important part from decision making is important uh, is that if your present value of cash inflow is greater than present value of cash outflow we say that the NPV the net present value is positive and the thumb ruling is if the NPV is positive we go ahead with the project if the NPV is negative you say no to the project. The another way of looking at it is consider the present value of cash inflow as your value to a particular project maybe it could be a machine or anything. So as per you something is worth that much and the $50,000 that you are spending is the market value of it. So if the market value is less than the value as per you or your required return you say you would like to go ahead with the project. And that's where the NPV positive uh, thumb ruling says go ahead with the projects, right? Another way to look upon to it, the NPV uh, calculation is limited to if there are two projects and you comparing and the NPV is coming as let's say dollar one positive for both. The ranking is same. Despite of maybe the fact that in project one, you are required to go with an initial outlay of one dollar and in project Two, you are required to go with an initial outlay of $100. So obviously you would go with one because it is giving you a better return. To look upon to the return that you can get from a project in this example itself, near to the NPV key you have the IRR also. So <clears throat> just go on IRR and 
press the IRR key, you'll get maybe somewhere around 14.9% as your project's IRR. Now, how do you see the IRR? Look upon to the IRR as the project's expected return. This 10% is your required return. If the project expected return is greater than the required return, which you refer as your cost of capital, over here in any capital budgeting projects, we <coughs> refer interest rates as opportunity cost. So if the project is expected to give you 14.9%, you seek a 10% return, obviously you would invest into the projects. To say so, if the IRR is greater than COC, invest. If it is less than COC, say no to the project. Moving ahead, let's look upon to uh, two different ways of looking at uh, the interest returns generated over a period of time on investment. So one is the time weighted return and the other one is the money weighted return. Let's go along with both with an example. Mr. X purchases one share of XYZ limited at time T0 for $100 and then at time T1 for $125. Mr. X sells both the shares for $148 at time T2. Each year the stock paid a $2 dividend. Now the time weighted return is more to do with that uh, uh, compounding or the geometric mean as a thought which is coming uh, with more of a geo mean of a 2 years HPY. Holding period return is simply the ending value that you have plus any dividends minus the beginning value upon the beginning value. So if you look upon to the HPY for first year, it is 125 plus 2 dollars of dividend on one share minus 100 divided by 100 with the initial investment amount. Your return for first year is 27%. For the second year, your beginning value would be 125. So the return is 20%. Now what you're basically doing is determining the geometric mean and that comes out to be 23.45%. The broader thought of time weighted return is if $1 invested today, let's say uh, into a recommendation by an analyst, what it will fetch in this example after two years. So it will give you a return on an annualized basis of 23.45% a CAGR a compounded annual growth rate kind of a thing of 23.45%. So when you look into the entire investment uh, performance uh, reports, basically an analyst always show a time weighted return. But from an investor per se, what is more important for him is what kind of a return is he getting on his investment. So in this example, the outflows could be charted as in C0, uh, the base year he has invested $100. In the next year he invests $125 more but gets a $2 dividend. So his net outflow is minus $123. And eventually uh, the investor sells both the shares at $148 each. So that is $296 plus a $4 dividend makes the cash inflow in the second at the end of second year as 300 and we're just trying to compute the return on the money so we do that by computing the irr which is coming as 22.29 percent now, now there is always uh, this thing which among the two returns will be and that's the kind of questions you could expect into the cfl level one curriculum uh, given a situation you might have to take a call whether the money weighted return for an investor will be more or the time weighted. So it's a very simple thought. If uh, with the time weighted return you invest your entire sum at point T0 only today itself. On the money weighted return your money gets invested gradually and that's why the returns are different in two. So if uh, you have invested the entire sum at T0 and throughout the uh, passage of investment the returns have been positive more or less the time weighted return will be higher than the money weighted return if let's say first year return has been negative and if you as an investor has not parved your entire money in the first year then in the next year when the returns are positive when you pour more amount of money your money weighted return in this situation will be far more more bigger compared to the time weighted return. You can do the calculations also but at times by sheer judgment you can make out whether the money weighted return is more 
or the time weighted return is more. Let's move to the last segment of the discounted cash flow chapter. Over here, we will be talking about uh, different varieties of rates into different US markets for different securities. So majority of T-bills are quoted on bank discount yield, that is BDY, which is basically calculated as discount upon face value into 360 by days. So let's say there is a T-bill, uh, a 90-day T-bill, which is quoting at 6% uh, annualized uh, return so it's it, remember the six percent is basically an annualized return and if you are investing for 90 days it eventually comes down to one and a half percent for a 90 day quote which is basically if it is a hundred thousand uh, dollar t-bill so this will be 1500 the face value is hundred thousand dollars and obviously this is how you go in terms of calculating the bdy right that is 360 by 90 and so for a 90 day t-bill the absolute amount of discount is 1500 which is basically one and a half percent of the face value for on an annualized basis it comes down to six percent now there is there is there is something which is very important to understand here that the bank discount yield uh, does not take into consideration two important aspects first it divides the uh, interest component of the return by the face value and not by the price which is basically not hundred thousand dollar but effectively you're getting fifteen hundred on ninety eight five hundred and that is what is been covered into the other reel which is money market reel at times quoted as rmm so over there you see the formula changes rather than taking f it takes the price which is basically the actual return that you're getting for that particular holding period for 90 days you're getting 1500 on 98,500 and not on hundred thousand dollars right so that is something that the money market yield takes into consideration but both of this yield does not uh, take one very important thing that is the compounding aspects so if let's say after 90 days an investor gets hundred thousand dollars and then he invests the entire hundred thousand dollar rather than just the principal of ninety eight thousand five hundred. So what the uh, the two uh, uh, rates that we have discussed, the bank discount yield and the money market yield, uh, they take both into consideration the simple interest aspect and not compounding. So if you have to go down to consider the aspect of let's say compounding then we might have to look up onto this to the most effective format which is the effective annual and it's you see the formula for effective annual rate yeah yield is one plus HPY everything is coming down to the HPY which we have discussed is nothing but let's say in this case the holding period yield is 1500 divided by 98500 so that's your HPY right 1 plus the HPY to the power 365 divided by tie days and that is where you're taking into consideration that for 90 days if you give got x amount of return if you keep on compounding that for coming successive days then your annual effective yield or the annual effective rate comes down to be 1 plus HPY to the power 365 divided by days minus 1. Lastly, let's talk about the last yield which is the BEY, bond equivalent yield. Now, normally bonds which are generally issued pay a semi-annual coupon also. The, you receive basically a coupon payment in 6 months and that's why we talk about semi-annual effective and then multiplying it by 2. Let's say the HP5 for an investment of 2 month is, is, is let's say 2 uh, percent then how do you go about calculating the BEY 1 plus that HPY now this is for 2 months you take it semi-annually by taking it to the power 3 minus 1 will give you let's say the return and multiply this value with 2 so you get basically the bond equivalent yield which is taken into consideration the aspect of compounding uh, till six months and then the coupons are paid and further six months the same returns are given so if you talk about the four returns bdy takes into consideration uh, 
fails across with the uh, taking in terms of price and as well as uh, comes across only with simple interest as a thought money market yield does make a, um, a correction with bdy with regard to rather than taking the face value it takes the price but does not look upon to compounding of returns and the effective annual yield or effective annual return is the one which gives you the most effective return that an inv investor can get by uh, a compounding consideration in terms of return generation now from an examination point of view when you are faced with questions on uh, bdy rmm uh, normally there are questions which comes with regard to let's say if you're given the uh, bank discount yield you are try uh, you have to find out the rmm or if you given the rmm you might have to find out the effective annual yield or the uh, uh, from one yield to another always focus on the hpy if you can come down to hpy then everything can be determined from the hpy only so try and come down to the holding period yield from an examination point of view everything will be pretty easy uh, best wishes from this segment uh, for the examinations for any queries do write to us we'll be very happy to help you across thank you